me tonight. This evening, I would like to talk to you about the armor of God. This is something that is specifically mentioned a lot in Ephesians chapter 6. However, there are many other verses throughout the Bible that talk about it. I would like to take a more applicable approach tonight. So, what truly is the armor of God? There it is. Some might say that that's the armor of God. This was taken in April of 2015 at our previous congregation. This was about half the youth group at the time. <laughs> that's me and my brother. Our, uh, our teacher, who was my dad, decided it would be really fun if we dressed up in the armor of God. So we did. We took for about three months and we dissected the armor of God at least as much as we could at that time um, and we put together this armor and we've got all of the pieces and we took one one class time and we just we put together the armor and then during one of the songs all of all of all four of us marched forward in the armor to the song the battle belongs to the Lord that was truly a great day. Everyone was smiling, everyone was excited, but I don't think anyone was quite as excited as the kids because we were learning, but we also got to dress up. We got to experience this armor in our everyday lives. Now, obviously, not everyone can dress up like this and go out in the world and preach the word, but I think we need to keep that same excitement even when we're wearing the spiritual armor. And there are, um, there are many pieces to the armor. There, are, or there is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Say that five times fast. Um, here we are. Uh, preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. If you would like to, Let's turn to Ephesians 6, there we go, uh, 6, verses 10 through 12. Now we will be spending quite a bit of time here in Ephesians 6, so if you'd like to keep a mark there, that would probably be beneficial. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This passage explains why we need the armor of, in the world. Let's talk about the individual components of the armor and how they work together. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 14, it outlines, outlines the belt of truth. It says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we're just going to talk about verse 13 and the first part of verse 14. This shows that we need to protect ourselves from the lies of the world so that we can stand with confidence, with boldness, as Mr. Gene was talking about this morning, that we can make a difference, that we can show the true power of the armor. But most importantly, this is a basis for everything else that we're putting on. That's why it's mentioned first. If you'll turn to John chapter 14, verses 5 through 6. John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
in this passage, we are shown that Jesus is the very truth that we are supposed to gird ourselves with. We are supposed to wear the truth of Jesus for all to see. That is how we should be living our lives. We should go throughout the entire world proclaiming this very truth that we live. Not only that, but the belt also supports other pieces of the armor. It supports the breastplate. It holds up the very righteousness that we stand for. It's where we place our sword. Because when we are speaking the word of God with truth, not taking it out of context, but truly showing the word of God, that is where we're going to make the biggest impact. Let's talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, if you'll turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Again, it's just the second part. It says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, period. That's it. That's all we get. But this is why it's so important that we look at the whole Bible. Because if you look at Isaiah chapter 59, verses 15 through 17, we get a little bit more insight. It says, For he put on a breast, as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation. On his head, he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Isaiah is prophesying specifically about Jesus here and about his righteousness, the righteousness that he is going to spread throughout the world. Not only that, but at the same time, we need to be sharing this same righteousness with others in the world, the righteousness of God, because that's the only righteousness that there is. If you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, we get a little bit more on this. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Here, Peter is specifically warning us against the temptations of the world, or flesh, fleshly desires, as the text reads. This prepares us, as do many other scriptures, for the danger that we will face. Back to Ephesians chapter 6, we get to look at the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of feet, of the gospel of peace. Verse 15 says, And having shone your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to be ready for the things that the world is going to throw at us. We get a little bit more in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. It says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Here in Romans, Paul is specifically quoting Isaiah, talking about the coming of Christ. And showing that we need to be pushing forward. We need to be going out in the world and talking to people. Not only talking to people, but showing people how we need to be living under this coat, if you will. But one thing that I think we all studied in previous studies of the armor of God is that it's based on Roman armor. Now the Romans their sandals, they were built specifically to have traction. They often had tacks in the bottom of their shoes or some sort of thing like that to provide them traction on any surface so that they could not only stand their ground, but push forward. All right, I think we have frozen up there. Um, 
but pushing forward so that we are not falling back, so that we are not stumbling in this world. They often prided themselves in the way that they marched as well. They practiced and practiced and practiced to the point that they were able to be in such synchronization that they were heard for miles around. Their enemies heard and they feared for what was coming because they knew that the Roman army was not something to be messed with. And we need to apply that to our spiritual lives, the way that we walk. We need for people to know what's going to happen when we step into a room, to know that we are going to be an example of Christ and that we are going to share that with them. If you'll turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. I'm sorry. Um, yes. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. But this can't happen, this boldness and this ability for people to know what's about to happen, for us to be such an example without faith, specifically faith in God. If you'll turn back to Ephesians in verse 16 of chapter 6, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Paul specifically prefaces this with above all. It's very important. Not only that, but we get a specific use. It's to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. These can be the temptations of the world that are thrown at us that we have to be strong enough to defend ourselves against. This is also examples that we see many times throughout the New and Old Testament. There we go. We are shown several times throughout the New Testament why this is important. And we're shown once more in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and the only potentate the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. This scripture shows that we can have strong faith in Christ Jesus, who died for us, for our sins that we could be saved, that we could eternally be with him. It also shows that we must continue fighting. No matter how difficult the fight may become, we must press on. The Hebrew writer echoes this sentiment in chapter 10, verses 35 through 39.
he writes, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to saving, to the saving of the soul. We must have endurance in our walk, and sometimes that means patience in a situation. We need to have faith in God. But what exactly is faith? The Hebrew answer, the Hebrew writer has an answer for that as well. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, it states, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the words, the worlds, were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This faith in everything that was created being made of things that aren't visible, this faith that God is the creator of the universe, this faith that by his fullness, by his strength, he can make us, his weak creations, strong. That he can make us so intelligent that we are able to go out and we are able to be productive in society and that we are able in that society to share the word of God. We need to have faith. And that faith in Christ is what leads us to salvation. In Ephesians chapter 6, the first part of verse 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation. Again, we're not given much, but that helmet of salvation is a very important aspect. They're all important, but this one in particular. Thankfully, in this wonderful book that God has preserved for us, we have other places that talk about this helmet of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This shows how great the salvation is and how all-powerful Christ is that he could become the perfect, or that he was perfected and became the author of eternal salvation. And that is why we have hope for the future. That is why we have faith in God that we are able to go out and boldly share the gospel and boldly make a difference in this world that doesn't want to change. That's why in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he leaves us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. That is why we have faith. That is why we have hope in an eternal salvation. In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, we get more hope, more boldness. He says, in being heirs to the throne of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, we have salvation. Back to Isaiah chapter 59, where we left off in verses 17 and 18. Right, let's get back there. It 
it says, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay. Theory to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands, coastlands, he will fully repay. Isaiah, as mentioned before, is talking about the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He also says that God will repay his enemies and his adversaries. This shows that vengeance is truly his in the day of judgment, as it says in Romans. And this should also give us hope that we will have justice in the Lord's time, should we only obey him and follow him and continue to put out an example in our community. Back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. We get to my personal favorite, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 18. We get to my personal favorite, favorite, the sword of the spirit. The sword is very powerful in a few ways, but especially that it's double-edged. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we are warned of the power of this tool. In that Hebrews passage, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Acts, we see this used in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. This is on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, we see the aftermath of this. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to their number. That's the kind of difference that we should be striving to make every day. We should be going out, talking to people. In normal conversation, we should be sharing this word. Not throwing scripture at them, because they're not going to understand. Paul tells us several times that God made him able to connect with people on a personal level. We're not going to connect with people by throwing scripture at them. We need to talk to them in their language, if you will. We need to talk to them in the way that they will understand. But we need to be sharing the gospel in our words and in our actions. And we need to be bold in this, as Christ was bold. And we need to have faith in our hope of salvation. For the final time, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 18, it sums it up quite nicely. 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Again, we need to be going back to God. This sounds like a big task to be going out and sharing everything to be examples and ambassadors of Christ. And that's because it is. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We need to be a light. In John chapter 8, Verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In our everyday lives, we must shine the light that leads souls to salvation. The light, the example that Christ leaves for us. Again, this sounds like such a big task, using our double-edged sword not to push people away, but to edify them and to make them seem like they're part of something, part of something bigger, that somebody loves them. That's how we should make people feel. And that's why, with this daunting task that God provides, he left us this passage in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. This is my favorite passage from cover to cover for this reason. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That is why we can have boldness. That is why we can have faith and hope in salvation. That is why we can be righteous, upheld by the truth of God. That is why we can go out in the world boldly and share these things in our words and in our actions. But maybe you're here tonight and you feel that you haven't been the example that you need to be. Or maybe you feel that you haven't been acting as boldly as you should. Maybe you're here and you're considering putting on Christ in baptism. Or maybe you have some other need and you don't know where to turn. 
Well, first, I would strongly advise you, read through Philippians chapter 4. It's helped me many times. But second, go ahead and have a seat in the front row. We would be more than happy to pray with you and pray for you as together we stand and sing.